So I told you guys that I went to that antique shop and I bought a biology book that was written in 1944 and that it had a, not a chapter, but like a piece of a chapter, right? About eugenics. So I'm here to read that to you all. I made a promise. I told y'all that I've been buying these books from these antique shops and stuff and I just been collecting them. I ain't looked at none of them, y'all. Speaking of which, I still got to finish Negro Myths on the Georgia Coast. I have not forgotten about that. But let's get into this biology textbook. So first I'm going to read from the excerpt where eugenics is defined in this book. So a number of studies have been made of human genetics and its relation to man's biological and social problems. This science, now known as eugenics, you, well, genos, birth, received a lot of attention from the Greeks. After a lapse of interest through the centuries, it was reestablished by Sir Francis Galton, who said that eugenics was the study of all the agencies under social control, which may improve or impair the inborn qualities of future generations of man either physically or mentally. In other words, it was the science of being well-born. Now, I'm going to skip a couple paragraphs because it's talking about, oh, various studies of human genealogies indicates that many traits are inherited according to the same principles, so-and-so-and-so, blah, 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 right? I'm also going to skip the paragraph that is about fingers and toes and eye color. I'm skipping down to the paragraph that is about texture and color of the skin, okay? So it states that these are hereditary traits. Sometimes the skin becomes dry, thick, and scaly in appearance. This condition known as icky, it, ichthyosis, <laughs> I can't even read that, seems to be dominant over normal skin. Rubber skin or cutis laxa is a skin defect in which the skin loosens and may be pulled out from the body for a distance. Attention has already been called to the fact that in crosses between Negroes and whites, the skin colors appear to be due to cumulative factors. There are more than 100 abnormal skin conditions which are known to be inherited. Now, let's read from the header that says, Human Heredity and Modern Social Problems. We have already shown that hereditary characteristics of both animals and plants are carried by the chromosomes in the germ plasm, and that inheritance apparently follows definite rules or laws. It has been pointed out that environment plays a real part in the development of plants and animals. Apparently, the expression of the hereditary potentialities of the germ plasm depends upon its surroundings. Evidence has been presented which indicates that man's heredity and development follow the same general principles as those we have seen operating in other animals and plants. With this in mind, let us now consider the possibility of improving man and his civilization by the application of some of the principles of modern heredity, a sociological biological problem. It must be said here, however, that man in the past and even in the present has paid more attention to the breeding of wheat, pigs, and chickens than he has to the breeding of his own kind. Now, I'm not going to read the next few paragraphs. It just talks about how, like, the study of heredity has been lacking because... For a long time, when people did, you know, family trees and stuff, they only focused on the men because in society only men matter, right? But this is steep when it comes to heredity because women offer just as much of the genes to the child, right? So, let me skip to this paragraph. Now, as we are to make a scientific study of heredity, we must approach the problem with open minds. In the next place, we must consider all the data, that is, all we can find, bearing upon the problem. The true scientist cannot seize upon and exploit only that evidence which supports his own preconceived notions and ignore evidence which seems to point in another direction. The scientist must be on guard not to stress extremes, whether good or bad, and ignore the average. Moreover, all factors which might have bearing on the problem must be considered. Last but not least, accurate measuring devices which tend to eliminate human judgment should be used whenever possible. Now, I'm going to skip the next, like, two pages because it's just sharing some examples of some families. Oh, the Jukes family, okay, where there was some man in early colonial western New York, okay, and he was a shiftless, thieving, illiterate backwoodsman, and look, all of his descendants were ABC and XYZ, right? So I'm skipping to the eugenics program. 
The eugenics program in the light of population trends. According to recent studies on population trends, not enough children are being born to replace the present populations in the nations of Western Europe and the United States. These countries seem to be at the beginning of a period of national decrease. At the same time, there is no proportionate falling off in such countries as China, Japan, and India. The high birth rate of the Japanese is claimed to be the reason for the program of Japanese expansion in the Far East. Now, as Osborne points out, outside of a wholesale and unparalleled destruction by war, births will determine what races will survive, what language groups will increase, which regions of the world will feel a pressure of population, and which will be undercultivated, which cultural groups will grow, and which will decline. Thus, this difference in birth rates between the nations and groups of nations causes grave fears for national security and existence. Suppose that we concern ourselves with our own national problem. It is quite possible that our present population is about optimum size for our country. If this is true, then our problem from the standpoint of eugenics is not only the maintenance of this present population number, but the maintenance of an optimum composition of our population groups as well. Let us consider the racial aspects of population trends in the United States. The rate of reproduction among Negroes is now greater than that of the whites, and the Negroes, Indians, and Mexicans are the groups which present the most serious cultural problems in our country. When we examine the birth rate of the whites with respect to the standard of living, we find that it is highest in the poorest sections of the population. In fact, it is approximately twice as high. This means that the greatest number of children have the poorest environmental opportunities. Fasten states that the aim of eugenics is to develop a social consciousness which will result in the humane treatment and eventual elimination of the hopelessly crippled, diseased, and mentally incompetent, and at the same time increase the number of children produced by normal individuals constituting our present civilization. To this end, careful studies must be made of heredity and environmental relationships, and more detailed records of heredity must be compiled and recorded. Campbell divides the human population into three groups. One, the best stock is made up of gifted individuals who are the leaders in society and who control it to a large extent. This group comprises about one-tenth of the population. Two, the good stock is comprised of normal, law-abiding, economically independent people. They not only take care of themselves, but also make a worthwhile contribution to civilization. About eight-tenths of the population belong to this group. Three, the bad stock or dysgenic group. This equals bad, genos equals race, furnishes the other one-tenth of the population. Here are found the majority of the feeble-minded, insane, prostitutes, paupers, criminals, and the like. These individuals make no contribution to society, but on the contrary, constitute a burden and a menace. Moreover, this is the group which is multiplying most rapidly. In view of these facts, then, it would seem that the method of attack should be to encourage the first two stocks to increase and, at the same time, to try to eliminate this last group. Such a program must involve extremely careful study of authentic records, careful weighing of hereditary and environmental influences, and, finally, an evaluation of the characters sought for. Marriage. Recently, it has been proposed that all those contemplating marriage must pass a rigid physical and mental test to determine what, if any, undesirable traits they may have which would be transmitted. This would involve a careful weighing and balancing because some of our greatest scientific and literary men have been weak physically. Moreover, to determine the mental and physical traits, there should be available also a careful compilation of individual genealogies. In the event of failure to pass these examinations, permission to marry would be given only after certain operations have been performed, which would eliminate all possibility of offspring or certain information given concerning the control of reproduction. The fit should not merely be allowed to marry, but should be encouraged to marry and to reproduce as rapidly as possible, certainly at a rate to balance the defective 10%. Some of the encouragements offered in various countries of the world today are bonuses for children, which will enable the parent to support a large family in comfort, assured incomes for a family based on family size, tax reductions favoring the heads of large families. Today, most tax reductions are in favor of the defective. The encouragement of bachelors and spinsters to marry by levying heavier taxes on this group, together with employment and housing discrimination favoring the man with a family. Segregation and sterilization. The two methods most frequently proposed for the elimination of the undesirable 10th are segregation and sterilization. 
This is the only way to get rid of defective genes on a large scale. Marriage too often only covers them up. In the segregation of defectives, the two sexes are separated and placed for life in different institutions where they must be carefully supervised and cared for. Naturally, this requires an annual expenditure of millions of dollars, which we all pay. Moreover, in actual practice, inmates of these institutions often wander off and become the origin of new generations with poor germplasm. The process of sterilization deprives the individual of his powers of reproduction, but leaves his other functions unimpaired. This operation consists of closing, cauterizing, or removing a portion of the vast deferens of the male or of the oviduct of the female. The result of these operations is to prevent the escape of ova or spermatozoa and forestall fertilization. The normal sexual behavior and responses are unimpaired. After any of these operations, these defectives could be released and allowed to marry. In castration and ovariotomy, the entire gonads are removed and the individual's sex behavior is much changed. This operation should be only used in, excuse me, should be used only in extreme cases. Okay, now I'm skipping to the paragraph on immigration. Immigration is a source of good germplasm as well as poor germplasm. Immigration laws need to be based not only on the present health and wealth of the individual, but also on his past family history. We need to know the IQ as well as the pulse rate. It is useless to propose marriage laws based on genealogies for ourselves and at the same time waive these considerations for newcomers. Our immigrant laws should be based on the study of the individual rather than of great groups. At the present time, there is a favored swing to the Nordic and Anglo-Saxon. Apparently, it is forgotten that we owe our religion to the Near East, our arts to Greece and Italy, and our laws to Rome. Now I'm skipping down to the part on inbreeding. Inbreeding, one of the most effective ways to get rid of defective traits and to establish desirable ones is to inbreed. That is, to mate father with daughter, brother with sister, and the like. The professional plant and animal breeder does this constantly, selecting his desirables and discarding the undesirables until a super variety of corn, wheat, sheep, or horses is produced. Theoretically, this procedure could be carried on with man, but obviously the practical obstacles are insurmountable. Next, war. No activity of man is so destructive of good germplasm in such a record of a eugenics program as war. The choice of the mentally and physically fit are marched off to be slaughtered. The rejected unfit are left behind to breed the next generation. One major war can undo countless years of careful planning, repeal the eugenics laws of the statute books, and set back society and civilization half a century or more. In war, there is not a survival of the fit, there is the survival of the unfit. Finally, eugenics and democracy. The ideal eugenics program aims to better the quality and maintain an optimum quantity of the population. It seeks to raise the average level of desirable human variations and at the same time eliminate those which are undesirable. This is especially true regarding individuals with low intelligence. The program of eugenics in democracy calls for a selective process which is natural and largely unconscious but one in which the greater number of children will be found in the families which are most competent irrespective of wealth or social status it is very doubtful that democracy can long survive in any nation unless the most competent people in the various social and occupational groups have favored conditions for survival now, let me tell you what's about to happen. White people are about to come to the comments and make themselves the victim. That's kind of their thing. Come on. Like, everybody has a thing, you know? So they're going to come to the comments and be like, okay, yeah, black people were mentioned, but so were white people, right? They're going to be like, oh, yeah, the top one-tenth of white people said they were the best and, you know, the rest of us are all right or bad, you know, and it's about socioeconomic status and yada, 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 and so and so and so, right? They're going to attempt to paint themselves as the ultimate victims and act like they are at the same level of black people in this society that we don't live in a racial society we live in a you know a classist society right but how about you go ahead and look up eugenics in the united states and let's just look at the state of north carolina okay of 7600 forced sterilizations that occurred right in north carolina right these are performed on women in that state 5,000 of them were performed on black women. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that math don't quite math for me. Like, let's try, to, let's try to work through this, right? 
Now, I don't know what North Carolina's racial demographics were back then, but in 2020, black people made up 20% of North Carolina's population. So using that, right, let's, let's pretend that black people made up 20% of North Carolina's population back then, right? Well, 7,600, 10% of that is 760, right? Times two, well, 700 times two is 1,400, 60 times two is 120. So 1,520 would be how many of those forced sterilizations should have occurred on black women, right? Since we only make up 20% of the population right but five thousand of them happened on us so it seems a little racially motivated doesn't it now i went ahead and i googled right i googled uh what percent of north carolina's population was black in 1950 and the answer was 25 percent. so not that much more than today right so we should have only made up 25 percent of north carolina's for sterilizations but instead we made up 66 percent so yeah the math still doesn't quite math for me according to wikipedia 31.6 percent of african-american women who only had a high school diploma were sterilized versus 14.5 percent of white women who only had a high school diploma so for the white people who are coming to the post to be talking about hey, well, we're all in this together it's not about race it's about class well why then when everything is accounted for right when we compare oh the same educational status the same socioeconomic status the same whatever right and the only difference is race <laughs> why then are the numbers not similar if it's not about race and it's about all these other things right or, or class or this or that or whatever right again the math is not mathing for me the point of this little chat was this white people it's time for you to stop pretending that the system will at all ever in any capacity target you the way that it targets black people now don't get me wrong am i saying that the system doesn't target you at all absolutely not you know white folks love them a little white on white crime now hold up like i ain't saying you ain't getting targeted out here like we but realistically you're not getting targeted like black people and let's stop pretending that the main you know form of oppression in this world is not racism because y'all love to pretend that y'all are the most oppressed people in the world and y'all simply are not